All right, pleasure to meet you all. I'm Evan Itkin. I'm presenting my SYP. I assume you know that's what you're here for. Um, so I'm a big outdoor person. I'm a runner, a biker, a hiker, a camper, like some of everything. So when I see things like this, trash, plastic, gross stuff that people left in parks outside, that makes me upset and not happy at all. So I really want to do a project about avoiding plastic, why it's bad for the world, what's wrong with plastic, why we should all avoid plastic, never touch it, it's the worst. But studying this, I've sort of realized it's a necessity. Um, doing my research paper, building the boat, thinking about the project. Initially, I wanted to do a more Walden-esque sort of thing where I tried to abstain from plastic altogether for some period of time, probably two months or so, and write about how it went. But then I realized I really enjoy the internet too much to do that. I enjoy my computer. I like my phone. They're all made of plastic. Um, vegetables come in plastic bags. I like eating vegetables. It's, it's really something you can't avoid, avoid. Even building this, where I tried to make a boat using no plastic, I had to use plastic, because when you buy a string, it comes in a plastic bag. So I edited my goal. I thought, I will lent plastic. I, I will practice lent in one area that I love and do it without plastic. So being an avid boater, I decided I'd make a kayak without using plastic. I had no clue how to do this. It's not something I normally do, but Thoreau, author of Walden, had my back. He says, it's not important what you do, it's important what you learn from what you do. It's important what you gain from, from completing something. Um, so to start, I will take you through the life cycle of plastic. Most Americans, a 2007 study showed, most Americans don't actually know plastics come from oil, come from petroleum. Granted, that figure is going down annually. There are more, made of plast more plastics made of corn and other biodegradable compostable products, but 8% of petroleum drilled annually goes into the plastic industry. About half of that gets burned off into transport, it burned off into fossil fuels in transportation, um, factories, things like that. The other 4% of that oil drilled annually goes into making these plastic nurdles, tiny pellets that are the building block of all things plastic. If you have anything made of plastic, you have a factory making things out of plastic, they order nurdles and put them in molds to make their plastics. So the nurdles get made in Asia, usually plastics are surprisingly often made in America or South America, not usually Asia for more expensive plastics like cars, cell phones are often made in America. So these nurdles get shipped overseas in huge shipping crates, about 10,000 of which annually fall off of boats into the ocean. This is a big problem before the plastic even reaches us because when you have these tiny pellets floating around the ocean, they float, they don't sink. Microscopic life grabs onto them, holds on, and follows the, the ocean currents with the little nurdles, and it introduces species to places where they naturally don't exist. It can destroy entire marine ecosystems before you even get to touch your plastic material. But despite being made of oil, despite being a pollutant before it even reaches you. Plastics are vital to life. They, they actually, in a lot of cases, will increase efficiency. I was, I was a big like, anti-plastic advocate. It's, it's bad for everything. But it turns out there are instances. The Boeing Dreamliner, over 50% of its components that are traditionally metal have been made of a plastic alloy. This increases its fuel efficiency by over 20% which on a long-term basis is, is really impressive. That's a lot of fuel savings, even though you use petroleum to make the plastic parts. On the other hand, 
plastic bags. They're one-use disposable things. There's a whole section of the plastics industry dedicated to producing disposables, soda bottles, plastic bags, everything you get, you use it once, you throw it away. That's a complete waste. This 70% of people who, who don't realize plastic is made from oils, they'll have a big issue recognizing the pure waste they're making by taking their plastic and instantly disposing it, using it once and disposing it. That's the exact opposite of conservation. But plastics are so necessary, it doesn't make sense to say no plastics. We aren't using those. After we use the plastics, there's the end of their life cycle. Um, we throw them away, 6% gets recycled. 94% goes to a landfill. That's kind of an issue. Not that landfills are purely bad. They, you see on the side of all the waste management trucks, land, our landfills provide 17,000 acres of wildlife habitat. That's, that's good for the world, but it would be even better if their landfills provided it without being full of recyclables. The 6% that is recycled goes back into the nurdle factory, is recomposed into tiny nurdles, and shipped back to the consumer stage again. So back to the kayak. As I said, I really had no idea what this is. Like six months ago, if you told me to make a kayak, it was impossible. I, I don't know what ribs are. I don't know what stringers are. I don't know what gunnels are. But it's been a learning experience. Um, I was initially very worried. I wouldn't be able to find anyone who knew how to make a boat. It's, it's not a very common art form, but I found this guy in California, Wolfgang. I think he's a German, whose, whose job is making these boats. He runs week-long classes where he teaches people to make Greenland kayaks. I was expecting I'd find someone from Greenland, like an Inuit on the internet, who would be able to teach me how to make these, but California, I guess that works too. So I emailed this guy a few times. He says, look at my website. I have plans up there for how to make a pretty typical 16-foot Greenland kayak. If you know what 16 feet looks like, this is about three feet shorter than that, because I messed up. Um, his plans were maybe a bit subpar. They were very helpful, but um, I messed up. I accidentally cut off three feet of the gunnels, or I accidentally cracked the gunnels and had to cut off three extra feet. But as I said, it's been a learning experience. It's an adventure. Um, yes, go for it. A gunnel is the long piece along the edge that goes from here, curves all the way around to here. Yeah, um, this end actually is sort of obliterated because I left on the part I cracked. But you're supposed to do this thing where you tie it together at the ends, you grab the middle, which will be together because they're straight pieces of wood. You're supposed to pull it apart. And you do that after you put on these risers at the end, which are doweled on. They're pegged in. You drill a hole through the riser, drill a hole through the gunnel, put a dowel through, and it stays on. When I drilled the holes, it sort of fell out the side. And when I went to pull it apart, it just cracked. It fell on itself. So I did have some issues. This is nothing like the plans he sent me. I had to come up with my own ideas, had to plan it myself. I had a lot of setbacks. And this is when I really realized like, where plastics come in useful in society. Um, while I was building this, I had a death, death in the family. That doesn't happen to plastic factories. They are a cushion for society. There's, there's no times that a plastic factory will say, no, we aren't making your boat because we want a day off. Their, their goal is to make nurdles, to make boats. 
that's how they make money. That it, it's a whole system set up just to do that, and that's that's the advantage of having a plastic society. You you don't need to have these breaks. There there's no personal connection where you can mess up, and it can be your fault. So what I got from this really was that even though plastics do end up in nature, they do end up polluting our waterways, they do end up killing over 250 different species of marine mammals every year, that's our fault. That's not plastic's fault. It's, it's us who takes the disposable plastics and thinks it's just a plastic bag. I'll drop it by the side of the road. It's us who takes the red solo cups and drinks from them and throws them away instead of washing them and reusing them or even using glass cups. It's, it's really our fault for misusing plastics. It's not an inherently bad material as I had initially assumed. The, the, the thing is, we just use it so badly, it ends up being in nature where it honestly doesn't belong. Thank you. You can ask questions? Yes. Yeah, questions. Okay, when you were talking about shipping overseas, whales, yeah. I think you said there were. Yeah. Why did they fall off the ships? Don't they put them in the bottom of the ship? So, no, they don't actually. There's a very silly thing going around the shipping industry where they just, you know, the giant shipping crates, you see them everywhere. They take them, they stack them on top of each other, 10, 15, 20 high, sometimes even on top of the ship. There are some really responsible companies who have implemented QR codes where if you want to ship with them, you have to put a QR code on your crate. You scan the code, it tells you how much it weighs, and they'll put the heavier crates at the bottom. But most shipping companies will just take a crate, put it down, take a crate, put it down, take a crate, put it down. And you end up with these huge empty crates full of light balloons or something on the bottom and tons and tons and tons of stuff on top of them. So if the ship hits a wave, the center of gravity is so high that entire stacks of crates will just fall into the ocean. There, there was actually, in American Samoa, there's a nationally protected reef where I think it was two months ago a shipping crate fell on it and the company that was shipping got sued over $10 million for dropping one shipping crate. So that, that's an idea of the sort of damage it'll do to the reef. I never knew that. <laughs> Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. And that was from waste management, who I assume would think we should say more is recycled than isn't, of course. because it's their job to look good. Right. So I was very surprised by that, too. I'm curious, you clearly sort of changed your mind. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. Your research. Were, were there particular people that, that helped you kind of think through this, this change of mind for yourself, or was um, it mostly reading? I wouldn't say it was so much reading articles as, as experiencing the building of this. I mean, as I was doing this, there was a death in the family, as I said. My grandma died, and I had to take off two weeks. Compared to a six-week-long time span, two weeks is a significant amount of time. And I realized while I was taking the two weeks off, if I were making this out of plastic, if I were a plastic factory making this, it would literally have taken 12 seconds to put this together. It's, it's not a big challenge to make it out of plastic once you have the whole system set up and ready to produce. So you could sort of see the benefits of Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, there were things I read that led me to change my mind. Like, there was an article, oh gosh, I forget who published it, but I read an article that claimed trucks driving full of plastic bottles instead of glass bottles were over 40% more fuel efficient per amount of liquid being carried because the glass bottles carry less liquid and weigh more. So th there were definitely some statistics I read that changed my mind, but at the same time, it was a lot just doing the project. I was um, surprised that you couldn't find anybody in this area 
but all the craftspeople, especially in New Hampshire and Maine, that didn't build boats. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure there are people around here who know how to do this, just without as prominent an image on the internet in the world. Because it's like, you can't really open the yellow pages for someone who knows how to build a kayak. I asked Mr. Tingle, the carpentry teacher, if he knew anyone who, who could help me out. He was like, yeah, no, not, no, not really. So I searched on the internet some, and I found a few books by this guy, Wolfgang. I found a few people who cited his books. Mm -hmm. So after I'd read so much about him, practically everywhere you look about Greenland kayaks, everything you Google, his name will show up. I decided to see about talking to him. Yes, there are. I've, I've, I've actually <laughs> become like a fixture in my community. Whenever people are going on their daily runs, walking by my house with their kids, they stop and go, oh, it's like I've been building the whole thing outside because it doesn't fit inside. <laughs> they go, oh, that, that's a cool boat you're building. My cousin lived in Maine, and he designed this plastic material where you can mold it, and the, the mentally challenged kids have classes where they put it together and put a two horsepower motor on it and they take it on the lake and it's a blast, you should look into it. Or my great uncle was, was a professional boat builder back when they made all the boats like this. You should, you should look into calling him. So after I got going, there were definitely a lot of interest. Um, no, that is actually Wolfgang's boat. I, I was a slacker. I didn't take pictures of my boat with canvas on it. But it will look like that. It will, except three feet shorter. Yeah, except three feet shorter. Yes. I have a question. How did you feel when you, it cracked? Did it happens, you know. Were you just, OK, I can deal with this? Or was it kind of devastating? Or? I mean, when, when you're standing, it cracked over there. So when you're standing here, pulling apart this way, and you suddenly just hear a big crack behind you, and you don't hear what it was, you have a second of like, oh, shit. That wasn't a good sound. But then, you know, you turn around, three feet fell off. Not a big deal. I can trim it down. I'll, it, it was actually a bit of a challenge. I enjoyed it because I had to redesign the whole thing because his instructions said, like, every foot and a half, put a deck beam, these cross members. Every six inches have a rib. So I really had to do a lot of redesigning, which is something I love doing. I, I, really like looking at things and figuring them out and tinkering with them. So after the initial shock and panic, I was really happy that I wasn't just copying his exact design. What kind of wood did you use? Um, mostly it's Douglas fir. The gunnels, deck beams, and stringers are all recovered Douglas fir. The ribs are oak because soft wood cannot be steamed at all. It just doesn't work. Um, the gunnels are just held apart by tension from these. What the instructions said to do was take a little piece, pull it apart, put the little piece in, then get a bigger piece and hammer that in, and get a bigger piece and hammer that in, all in the center just to push it apart. So I got too lazy to do that. It was cutting too many pieces of wood. It was a lot of wasted wood because you had to cut like an inch, two inches, three inches, four inches. So I just stood here and pulled it apart and had my brother to shove this in. Younger or older? Older. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so are you planning to use this? Yeah, definitely. Um, my family is really into boating. We already own three kayaks, actually. Red Loons. Question if you're a kayaker. Yeah. So it just looks very small. I mean, I don't know how you fit your feet, your legs. Um, I'm so. This is the back brace. There's a panel that comes up from here to add some support. Your feet go th under this. Yeah, Th this is curved so your thigh can fit in. And this is the footrest. Um, I actually did mess up a little measuring. The, this type of boat is very fit to the user. You're supposed to be snugly attached because the history of a Greenland kayak is to be used by Inuit hunters who would 
need to be very nimble through the water to throw their spears. There was a lot of waves, a lot of flipping, tipping. You were really supposed to have the boat be an extension of your body. It wasn't supposed to be you're sitting in the boat. It's an interactive relationship. So you're supposed to be really snug. I messed up measuring, wasn't wearing my shoes. When I measure the length of my feet, my toes actually go up to here. So I'm going to have to see about adjusting that. Um, so initially, not plastic. <laughs> not plastic, definitely not plastic. Initially, I was actually looking into using seal skin because that's the traditional way to do it. You can buy roadkill seals from the National Department of Recreation. Okay. Um, th th that's how all the museums have like their taxidermy seals and everything, right? So I emailed a guy from the Department of Recreation like, hey, how do I get my hands on a dead seal carcass? He said to send him $200, and that was more than I wanted to spend on a dead seal. So I'm going with 10 ounce canvas with oil or paint on it. Uh -huh. Are you, you going to roll with it? Hmm? Are you going to be able to roll? I will be able to roll. We'll see how I feel about rolling when we get in the water. <laughs> if it stays up. Yeah. Um, Talk a little bit more about some of the, the actual research and literature that you were using to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So most of my research was online. There aren't many books about pla plastic purely. There are a lot of books I read that mentioned plastic. I read a book by, his name's slipping me right now. It's called Chasing Sea Turtles. It's about sea turtles, and there's a chapter on sea turtles mistaking plastic bags for jellyfish and eating them, which is a big issue because plastic bags aren't actually biodegradable. You can't eat them. But most of my research was online articles from Rolling Stone, Royal Academy. Um, a lot of intellectual papers from Britain and Europe. Fiberglass equally bad? Um, fiberglass is technically a plastic resin. So the ways it's normally used don't tend to be as bad because it's normally used to make permanent fixtures. I, I differentiated in my presentation between the permanent uses of plastic and the disposable plastics. It's really something that's used to be more permanent and is usually more, um, more well discarded. It's um, what's, the, what's the word? There are a lot of laws regarding how you can discard a fiberglass and where it needs to go. And uh, from the instructions, were there other plastic parts that were included in the instructions you had to work around? Yeah, yeah, actually there were. He used nylon canvas for one. That was a big deal. Instead of having pegging everywhere, he used nails and screws, which I wanted to avoid because that's going right back into the petroleum industry for the mining and everything. I wanted to keep it all organic, all biodegradable. Um, he used, you can see the whole thing is lashed. I'm not sure if you can see actually, but the whole thing is lashed together. There are strings holding the keelson, ooh, Keelson and side stringers onto the ribs. There are strings holding the gunnels together. He said you should use nylon rope. I used manila rope. So probably what's going to happen is my string will rot in a few years and I'll have to replace it. But personally, based on my research, I think it's better that it rots in a few years and I'll have to replace it than it will be around literally forever. Hmm? Just the restringing of it could just be part of its natural maintenance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Did and you we, use hemp too? Or? Um, actually, I stayed away from hemp because it has very little lateral strength. Um, this is partly hemp, partly manila, but mostly it's just manila string. What about rawhide? Um, I could look into it. I'm not really sure how I feel about using animals on this anymore. I was really into the idea of seals, but <laughs> might have changed my mind a bit. I, even think of seals. <laughs> I mean, if, if it's a 
pre-killed seal that was completely accidentally destroyed. If it's a roadkill, you might as well use the parts to save it from being a complete waste of life. But if you're going to go and kill a cow just to get rawhide to string this, then my vegetarian roots start kicking in. Mm -hmm. Have you reached out to anybody online now? That, or has anybody re reached out to you knowing that you're doing this project? Just wondering you know, how you pulled it together? And, or, or would you consider you know, like training other people how to how to make these kind of things? Well, I definitely had a lot of emails with the guy who taught me how to make it, but I don't think I've had a large enough presence online to attract that much attention. I know my informal presentation has 12 views right now on YouTube. Most people have like one or two, so I'm kind of a big deal right now. <laughs> but I don't know. We'll see what happens. And on YouTube, does it have the shelf up there? The covering on it as well. Oh, no, because I hadn't actually put the cover on last Thursday. But if anyone wants, I can definitely email you more pictures. If you put this, uh, uh, the canvas over it, isn't it going to get in, in? Aren't you going to have trouble replacing the string once the canvas is there or not? Um, the canvas is just sewn on with normal thread, like slightly thicker than normal thread. So it's really easy to take on and off. I had it on earlier. I took it off so you could see this. So it's not a big challenge. And there is so much string that by the time it starts rotting, it will be a complete necessity. It'll be worth it to go through the effort of taking the canvas off to replace it. And also, the issue with canvas is if you don't use it in salt water, it will start rotting in five or six years, probably because of the microbes and everything that are more prevalent in fresh water. So if I need to replace the strings, I'll probably also need to replace the canvas. So it's more, it, it, it'll last longer in salt water? It will last longer in salt water. I don't know. Um, I'm taking a year off, definitely. I have every member of the family yelling at me from different sides, do this, do this, do this, no, do this. Watch um, the, uh, was it, the graduate plastics. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think you can open with that so you can do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, my cousin, actually, she graduated yesterday from Tufts, so we all went out to a big fancy dinner. She spent like half an hour talking to me about this organic farming program she did in Alaska, and she wants me to do that. Mom talked to me for hours about organic farming she did in Israel after high school. She wants me to do that, so we'll see. Yeah, yeah. I've done it for like a week, two summers ago. Alaska sounds kind of tough. During the summer, the south is nice-ish, yeah. And also there are so many national parks and rivers and waterfalls and glaciers, and it's beautiful. Yeah, definitely. I can have the most expensive luggage ever put on a plane. Take, no, wait, you can, you can take it down and put it down. Oh, yeah, I, I can <laughs> disassemble the whole thing, fit in a little box, right? Yeah. We can manage this. We'll manage. It's on the Dreamliner. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> can save fuel while transporting it to Alaska. All right, thank you so much, Evan. Thank you. All right, thank you.